evolution of the earth. If we ask how the human being has developed since earliest times up to the present day, we must first recall what has been said about the being of man. Man has seven members. The first is, so to speak, the lowest. The etheric body is higher and of finer texture. The astral body is still higher and finer. Of the ego body, only the first rudiments yet exist. It would be wrong to conclude that the highest body now possessed by man is the most perfect and the physical body the most imperfect. Exactly the opposite is true. The physical body is the most perfect part of the human being. Later on, the higher members will, of course, reach a higher degree of perfection. But at present, the physical body is, in its way, the most highly developed and has been constructed with ineffable wisdom. I once described to you, as an example of this wisdom and perfection, the structure of the thigh bone. Every single bone is so artistically structured and wisely devised as to perform the maximum work with the minimum mass, in a way no human engineer could equal. The more deeply we penetrate to an understanding of the wonderful structure of the human frame, the more marvelous will it appear to us to be. Take, for instance, the way in which the brain and heart have been designed. The heart makes no mistakes, but the astral body makes many. The passions and desires of the astral body surge against the physical body and overpower it. If a man eats the wrong sort of food, he is following the desires of his astral body. The physical heart keeps the circulation of the blood in order. The astral body incessantly attacks the heart because it craves for things harmful to the heart. Coffee, tea, alcohol are poisons for the heart. Yet the heart often has to cope with them every day, and in spite of everything, it keeps going. It is constructed so durably that it can withstand the attacks of the astral body for seventy or eighty years. The physical body is thus, in all details, the most perfect in the hierarchy of human bodies. Less perfect is the etheric body, and still less so the astral. The ego body is the least developed of them all. The reason is that the physical body has gone through the longest period of evolution and is the oldest part of the human being. The etheric body is younger, the astral still younger, and the ego body is the youngest of all. In order to understand how these bodies have evolved, we must realize that it is not only man who goes through successive incarnations, but that the law of reincarnation applies universally. All beings and all the planets are subject to this law. The earth, with everything that is on it, has passed through earlier incarnations, of which three in particular are our immediate concern. Footnote, to differentiate between the planetary stages of earth and its presence as a planetary body, the word has been capitalized only in the former case. End of footnote. Before the earth became the planet we know, it was a very different one. At the beginning of time it was a planet called, in occult science, Saturn. Altogether there have been four successive incarnations of the earth, Saturn, Sun, Moon, and Earth. Just as there is a Kamaloka and Devakan period between a person's successive incarnations, so is there between successive incarnations of a planet a period when it is not visible and has no outward life. This period has always been called Pralaya and the period of incorporation Manvantara. However, the names Saturn, Sun and Moon do not signify the heavenly bodies which are called so today. Our Sun is a fixed star. The old Sun was a planet and in the course of its incarnations it has worked itself up from the substance and being of a planet to the rank of a fixed star. In the same way, the old moon, as we call it, is not the same as the moon we know today. It was the third incarnation of the earth, and likewise 
Saturn was the first stage of the Earth's evolution. Even on the planet Saturn, man was present. Saturn did not shine, but it sounded, and could have been heard with devaconic ears. After existing for a certain period, it gradually vanished away, was for a long time invisible, and then shone out as sun. The planet Sun passed through the same process and reappeared as moon. Finally, after the same sequence, the Earth appeared. But we must not picture these four planets, Saturn, Sun, Moon, and Earth, as four separate planets. They are four different conditions of the same planet. They are true metamorphoses of the one planet, and all the beings that belong to it are metamorphosed with it. Man has never been on any other planet, but the earth has existed in these four different conditions. When the earth existed as Saturn, only the first germs of the kingdom of man dwelt on it. The marvelously artistic structure of the human body was then present only in barest outline. There were no minerals, plants, or animals. Man is the firstborn of our creative process. But Saturn man was very different from the human being of today. He was, for the most part, a spiritual being. He would not have been visible to physical eyes. And, of course, at that time there were none. Only a being with devaconic sight could have perceived him. The human form was like a kind of auric egg, and within it was a remarkably scaly structure, a sort of vortex, shaped like a small pear, and as though made of oyster shells. Saturn was permeated with these rudimentary physical structures, exudations, as it were, condensed out of the spiritual. From these structures, which gave only a faint indication of what they were to become, the physical body of man was gradually developed in the course of evolution. It was a kind of primal mineral, with no etheric body round it, Hence we can say that man passed through the mineral kingdom. But to think of it as anything like our present-day mineral kingdom would be quite wrong. On Saturn there was no kingdom other than the human kingdom. Now just as man passes through the various stages of his life, as child, young man or woman, old man or woman, so does a planet. Before Saturn manifested the flaky structures deposited within it, it was a, an arupa devakan structure, then a rupa devakan structure, and finally an astral structure. Then the flakes gradually disappear, and Saturn returns through the same stages into the darkness of Pralaya. A metamorphosis such as this, from the spiritual into the physical, and then back again into the spiritual, is called in theosophy a round or a life state. Each round can be divided into seven phases, arupa, rupa, astral, physical, and back to arupa. These phases, wrongly called globes, are in fact, quote, form states, close quote. But we must not imagine seven successive planets. It is always the same planet which transforms itself, and its beings are transformed with it. Saturn passed through seven such rounds or life states. In each round its structure was being perfected, so that only in the seventh round was its final perfected form attained. Each round is subdivided into seven transformations or form states, so that Saturn would have passed through seven times seven or forty-nine metamorphoses. That is true of Saturn and then of Sun, Moon and Earth. And in the future there will be three more planets, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan. Thus there, there are thus seven planets, each going through seven rounds, and each round through seven form states, expressed as 777 in occult script. In that script, seven is the unit position, excuse me, in that script, seven in the unit position means the globes, in the tens, the rounds and in the hundreds, planets.
We, therefore, have to multiply the figures, and so we find that our planetary system has to pass through 7 by 7 by 7, or 343 transformations. In H. P. Blavatsky's title, Secret Doctrine, which was in large part inspired by one of the highest spiritual individualities, we find a remarkable passage, quote, But the great initiates have always expressed themselves with caution and have given only hints. Above all, they leave some work for the human being to do. Close quote. This passage, as H.P.B. knew very well, is full of riddles. There is nothing there about successive incarnations. The teacher said only, quote, learn the riddle of 777, close quote. His wish was that people should learn for themselves that this meant 343. The secret doctrine gives the riddle but not the solution, which has been discovered only quite recently. The first germinal condition of man was thus to be found on Saturn in the most ancient times. Then Saturn vanished into Pralaya and reappeared as sun, and with it from the darkness of Pralaya came man, the ancient inhabitant of the universe. In the meantime, however, man had gained the power to separate something from out of himself, as the snail does its shell. He could separate shell-like structures as hovering forms. The finer substances he retained within himself so that he might evolve to a higher level. In this way he formed the minerals out of himself, but these were a living kind of mineral. On sun man evolved in such a way that the etheric body, as with plants today, could be added. On sun he therefore passed through the plant stage, and on sun there were thus two kingdoms, the mineral kingdom and the plant kingdom, and the latter was man. But these plant forms were quite different from those we know today. Anyone who understands the deeper connections at work in life will regard the plant as an inverted human being. Below is its roots, then come the stalk, leaves, stamens, and pistils. The pistils contain the female reproductive organs, and the stamens the male. In all innocence, the plant stretches out its reproductive organs to the sun, for it is the sun that kindles its reproductive power. The root is really the head of the plant, which stretches its reproductive organs out to the wide spaces of the world, while this head is attracted by the center of the earth. Man is the opposite of this. His head is at the top of his body, and below are the organs which the plant spreads out to the sun. The animal comes in between. Its body is horizontal. If you revolve a plant through 90 degrees, you get the position of the animals. Turn it through 180 degrees, and you get the position of man. The old occult science gave expression to this in the ancient symbol of the cross, saying, as Plato said, in the language of the old mysteries, the world soul is crucified on the cross of the world body. The world soul is contained in everything, but it has to work its way up through these three stages. It makes its journey on the cross of the body of the world. On sun, then, man was a plant being, upside down, compared with modern man. He lived in the sun and was himself part of its body. The sun was a body of light, composed of light ether. Man was still plant-like, his head directed toward the center of the sun. When, later on, the sun left the earth, the human being had to turn round. It remained true to the sun. In its first round, sun merely repeated the Saturn period. It was not until the second round that the further evolution of man began. When the sun had evolved to its limit in the seven rounds, it disappeared into the darkness of Pralaya and eventually reappeared as moon. The first moon round was again only a repetition of Saturn in a rather different form. The second round also brought nothing new. It was a recapitulation of life on the sun. In the third round there was something new. Man acquired an astral body, 
in addition to the two earlier bodies. In his outward form we might compare him to the animals of today, for he had three bodies. He had in fact reached the stage of the animal kingdom. He had raised himself to the plant kingdom by ejecting the mineral kingdom. Thus there were two kingdoms apart from man. Then he once more cast off a smaller part, separated himself from it, and went on to the higher level. During this third round of moon, an important cosmic event took place. Sun and moon separated. So there were now two bodies. At the beginning of the second round the sun was still there, unchanged. Then a small segment in the lower part of the sun detached itself, so that in the third round there were two bodies side by side. The sun kept the finer parts, sending rays to the moon from the outside and providing the moon and all the beings with what they needed. This was the advancement of the sun. It became a fixed star and is no longer concerned directly with the three kingdoms. It only imparts to them what it has to give. It gave a home to higher beings who now that the sun had got rid of its inferior parts could develop further. In the fourth round, all this reached its highest possible level. In the fifth, the two bodies reunited and finally disappeared as one body into Pralaya. The old moon has as yet no solid mineral kingdom. It was a globe which, instead of a solid earth crust, had something like a living and inwardly growing peaty mass not dissimilar to cooked spinach. This living foundation was permeated with woody structures out of which grew the plant kingdom as it then was. These plants, however, were really a sort of plant animal. They were able to feel and under pressure would have experienced pain. And man in the animal kingdom of the time was not like any animal of today. He was halfway between animal and man. He was of a higher order than our present animals and could carry out his impulses in a much more systematic way. But he was lower than modern man, for he was not able to say I, capital, to himself. He did not yet possess an ego body. Then these three kingdoms dwelt on the living body of the moon. An important fact is that these moon men did not breathe as man does today. They breathed fire, not air. Through this breathing in of fire, the warmth permeated their whole being. Then they breathed out the fire and heat and became cold again. What man has nowadays as the heat of his blood, moon men had in the warmth of their breath. Many of the older, still clairvoyant painters symbolized this in the image of the fire-breathing dragon. They knew that in ancient times there had been these moon beings who breathed fire. After disappearing into Pralaya, the moon reappeared as earth. In the first round, the whole Saturn existence was repeated. In the second, the sun. And in the third, the moon existence. During the third round, the separation of sun and moon was repeated. But on the returning path of this round, the two bodies reunited. In the fourth round, the sun and moon came forth again as one body, and now the earth began to form itself. At this point, an important event occurred, an encounter of the earth with the planet Mars. The planets interpenetrated, the earth going through Mars. At that time, Mars possessed a substance, iron, which the earth lacked, and Mars left this iron in the earth in a vaporous form. But for this occurrence, the earth would have had to remain as it was, possessing only what was already there. Man would have risen as far as the animal kingdom as it then was. He would have breathed warmth, but he would never have acquired warm blood, for there is iron in the blood. In fact, according to occult science, the earth is indebted to Mars to such an extent that the first half of its evolution is called Mars. Mercury has equal significance for the second half. Earth entered into a connection with Mercury and is still closely related to it. 
Hence, in occult science, the terms Mars and Mercury are used instead of Earth. This planetary stage will be followed in the future by three others, Jupiter, Venus, Vulcan. These seven stages of the Earth, as recorded in occult science, are preserved in the days of the week. Saturn, Saturday, Samedi, Zamstak. Sun, Sunday, Zontak. Moon, Monday, Lundi, Montak. Mars, Mardi, or Tiu, Tuesday. Mercury, Mercredi, Woden, Wednesday. Jupiter, Udi, Tor, Donner, Thursday. Venus, Vendredi, Freya, Friday. Thus do the names of the days of the week reflect the occult doctrine of the passage of the earth through these various stages. A remarkable chronicle, which makes it possible for these truths to be kept ever and again in mind. We shall in the course of the next few days, we shall see in the course of the next few days, how theosophy enables us to understand, for the first time, what our early forefathers expressed quite simply in names, and how the most ordinary everyday things are linked with the most profound. That's the end of Lecture 9, and there's an addendum to Lecture 9, Systematic Overview of World Evolutionary Stages. I'm going to read this somewhat quickly, I apologize. The Seven Consciousness States. Number one, trance or universal consciousness, Saturn. Number two, deep sleep or dreamless consciousness, Sun. Three, dream or picture consciousness, Moon. Four, waking or object consciousness, Earth. Five, psychic or conscious picture consciousness, Jupiter. Six, trans-psychic or conscious sleep consciousness, Venus, seven, spiritual or conscious universal consciousness, Vulcan. The seven life states, or rounds or realms, number one, first elemental realm, two, second elemental realm, three, third elemental realm, four, mineral realm, five, plant realm, six, animal realm, seven, human realm. The seven form states or globes, one arupa, two arupa, three astral, four physical, five sculptural, six intellectual, seven archetypal. Each form state passes in turn through seven times seven states. Our present state, for example, the fourth form state, of the mineral realm of the fourth planet Earth passes through the so-called seven root races and each root race in turn through a further seven subdivisions for example the cultural epochs of our present fifth root race. After each round occurs a short pralaya sleep condition and after every consciousness state a long pralaya.